Hello and welcome everybody. Um, my name is Ben Walters and I'm the communication specialist for the bird cams program at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Um, thank you for joining us today. Um, we're here today to learn more about the amazing winter finch species that we see visit our Ontario feeder watch cam. Not only will we be doing a deep dive into some of these amazing birds that we see, but we'll also be taking a tour behind the scenes at the American Museum of Natural History uh, with a special guest that I'm very excited to have with us today, Paul Sweet. I'll let Paul introduce himself here. Thanks, Ben. Um, it's a pleasure to be here um, on this snowy afternoon in New York City. And thank, thanks all of you for um, joining us. My name is Paul Sweet, and I work as the manager of the ornithology collections at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. Um, my job is kind of like a librarian of bird specimens, and I'd like today to show you later on um, some specimens of the winter finches after we see them at the feeder camps. Um, although some of the finches are pretty easy to identify, there are others that are uh, rather difficult, and I'll be going over some of the uh, finer points of the ID of some of these difficult birds. Awesome. Thank you, Paul, and uh, welcome. So before we get into um, some of the clips from the feeder watch cam, I wanted to share just a little bit of information about the site of the feeders. So this cam um, is located in the backyard of our hosts, Tammy and Ben Hache, and they live in Manitouage, Ontario, which is in the heart of Canada's Boreal Forests. And it gets some super amazing visitors at this site. We see ruffed grouse, Canada jay. Um, we've had a, a rare Western meadowlark visiting recently, but what we're here to talk about today is the diverse and vibrant, beautiful winter finches that visit this site. So many of the winter finches that we see visiting this cam are unique to the boreal forest. That's where they breed and spend most of their time throughout the year. Um, but in certain years, we do see eruptions, um, which you can think of as irregular winter migrations um, to areas south of their normal range as they search for a better food supply. So sometimes the, the trees in the boreal forest will um, um, have a, a really high food supply in certain years, and that's plenty of food for those birds um, to stay up in those areas. But others, they'll barely reproduce any seeds at all. Um, and then the birds will migrate south, sometimes in vast numbers. And one good thing we can say about 2020, finally, as, is that this is a super flight year for many of the species that we're going to see especially in the Eastern United States. Um, this means that many backyard birders might get the chance to see these birds um, alight at their feeders uh, when usually they wouldn't be seeing them in winter. So it's a really fun time. And I wanna uh, just do a quick shout out to Matt Young, who's a former colleague um, of mine at the Cornell Lab. And he's the founder of the French Research Network. Um, and he give, gave us some updates on where, where the different species of finches are being seen right now this year. Um, so thanks to Matt for that information. So um, to kick things off, I wanted to share a clip of some of these finches um, while they're foraging at the Ontario Feeder Watch Cam. So give me just a second to share my screen. So these are some of the most striking birds that we see visit the feeder, the evening grosbeaks and they are having a pretty amazing eruption year. Um, it's, it's destined to be um, maybe one of the best in the last 20 years. We've seen them in the Northeast, across the Rust, Rust Belt, and even into the South. We've seen sightings as far South as the Carolinas and even some in Georgia this year. And, and you can tell they're, they're really just um, super vibrant. The males have that yellow eye, um, sort of like visor, with the contrasting black and white wing patches. The females are the grayer birds that you see in this video. Fantastic birds. Um, it's really interesting that these birds about a hundred, over like a hundred years ago were not uh, common in the Eastern USA that they've, or even Eastern Canada, they've expanded their range uh, significantly in the last century. Okay, so the birds we have here now, we have two species of birds. The larger birds uh, on the feeder here are pine grosbeaks. These are birds that breed not just in North America, but all across the um, boreal forests uh, around the world, also in Eurasia. 
And um, the little guys are common red poles. These are little streaky finches. And if you look carefully, you can see on their uh, forehead, there's a little reddish spot, the red pole. And um, these are um, often found uh, feeding on your thistle feeder, perhaps. So I guess they do like sunflower seeds as well. You can see them. Yeah, and uh, the pine gross beaks, you can see there's, there's um, some differences in their plumage. The rosy red birds are the males, and then the gray birds with the yellowish rumps and heads, those are the female birds. It's really a gorgeous bird. And uh, these are the, probably the, the, the rarest, of, well, I'm ruling out the hoary red poles, but of the, most of the finches, um, these are the, one of the rarer of the uh, eruptive finches. Yep, and it's been um, a big year for them as well. Even though we don't often see them in the, even in the Northeast, there's already been sightings in Southern New York and Connecticut, and they could be moving even a little bit further south. Um, the red poles, on the other hand, um, this is a huge eruption year for them. It's possibly the largest we've seen in a decade. Um, we've already been seeing them across the Northeast and the Eastern Plains. And these are really hardy little finches. They breed all the way up in the northern latitudes of the Arctic tundra. Yeah, they're probably one of the more northerly of all the, the passerines. And, um, uh, you know, you can find them out in the barren grounds of, of the Arctic. Awesome. And, and so here's some purple finches. Some people in the Northeast might be a little bit more familiar with these birds because they do reside um, year round in, air, in areas of the Northeast. Um, but they are really beautiful birds. You can see the males are sort of soaked in a raspberry red um, uh, across the top uh, parts of their head and into their back a little bit. Um, the females have a prominent white eye stripe. Um, they're more brown um, and streaky across the, the belly and flanks. And uh, they are rather similar in the same, quite closely related to the house finches that we also commonly see around, um, well, pretty much all over North America, but we do see these in the Northeast, even in New York City year round. And um, later on, I'll be showing you some comparisons side by side, uh, particularly of the uh, females, so we can see um, the differences. And here we have um, pine siskins. This is a, another of the smaller finches. And we have, um, if you see, they're rather streaky all over, front and back. And they have um, a little patch of greenish in the, their flight feathers. And we have, um, we, in New York City at least, we had thousands of these birds passing through a month or so ago and um, in, in large flocks. Yeah, and um, the reports are that sometimes, you know, sometimes these birds can be pretty hard to come by in winter. We've already seen them. I've seen them at the feeders at, at, at the Cornell lab already this year, which was really exciting because um, we don't often, uh, don't always get them, but they're really moving broadly across the entire continent um, and visiting feeders frequently um, across the United States everywhere this year. So it's been really fun. And here's another evening growth speak, scaring off all the uh, system. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, finally, we have a red crossbill. This is a short clip, but I just wanted to put it in here because it's a rare visitor to the feeder. This clip was in 2017, which was the uh, last time uh, that we caught it on camera. It's actually a, the female bird, and it's a yellow bird with dark wings. You can see it contrasting in size with the pine gross beaks here. Yeah, crossbills are really uh, special birds. Um, we, um, again, only see them infrequently. They're quite variable in color. Oh, we can see, uh, I'll see some of those in a minute. Yeah, and so um, those are, are just, you know, some of the birds that we see at the Ontario Feeder Watch Cam, which you can watch live anytime at allaboutbirds.org slash feeder watch cam. Um, and, you know, going through, we were talking a lot about where you might be able to see these birds this year, but it, it really depends on where you live and, and what region you live in. So I thought I'd just spend a minute here um, showing you a cool tool that anyone can use to see where these species might be showing up in their areas. So if everybody can see my screen right now, um, 
This is the eBird.org. Um, it's one of their explore tools. You can see up here um, under the explore tab. And this is the, the species range maps and the, the sightings maps basically. So um, what you can do is you can key in what species um, you're interested in looking at. And we'll post this link in the chat for you if you wanna visit this site later. Um, and you can even set a date range for when you want to see when uh, when you want to see these sightings um, were seen. So I, I scheduled this for October to December, and right now I'm looking at evening grosbeak sightings in 2019 from October to December. And you can see they're you know in the mountainous west and across the boreal forest, a couple um, coming down into the northeast here, um, but not a huge eruption. Um, we usually see them out west here um, in numbers. So, but let me just show you what it looks like in 2020 because it's pretty exciting and it, and it um, really is a little bit of evidence to the major super flight year that we've seen so far. So you can see just how much that map has expanded if I go and I set this to the current year, um, 2020. And we've got this huge influx of gross beak sightings down across the Rust Belt um, into the Carolinas. Um, a bunch in the Northeast. And we also have this patch down in New Mexico, Arizona, Colorado, Utah. So anybody can uh, access these tools. The link is in the chat there. Um, and you can, you can search for any species in North America. Um, but right now these winter finches are, are catching a lot of people's eye. Yeah, it's such a powerful tool, eBird. I mean, it's, it really can, um, and of course it's all done by citizen science, everybody putting in their individual sightings. But once they're all gathered together in this in this huge database, you can see uh, so many things. Really fantastic. Awesome. So we wanted to uh, stop here just for a second and see if we see. I have a couple questions coming in um, to the chat here. One from Sonia. Um, she's asking, "Is it just coincidence that 2020 has been a good eruption year, or did something in particular contribute to this year?" Coincidence in terms of coincidence with all the other bad the things that have been happening this year. I, I don't know if it's connected, but you know, these, these eruptions are um, cyclical that, you know, there are certain boom and bust um, situations that happen in the boreal forest. Um, there's a kind of moth called a spruce bugworm that um, has its populations, you know, cycle some years, are, there's lots, some years there are a few and certain birds um, can feed on these and then their populations can expand the same it's not just with finches certain warblers also uh, benefit from these these things so um, the many things in nature are cyclical and and somewhat irregular so um, that's what's happening now yeah and an interesting note about the spruce budworm you know it's it's bad for trees but it's good for birds it's like the evening gross beak they they um, you know they will feast on those things when they're infesting the trees so um, let's see if we have another one here saying, what are the best foods feeders to put out to attract some of these birds? I know one person who had eight evening gross beaks at a safflower feeder in central New York state. Any other ideas for how I can attract these birds? I've gotten siskins so far, says Sarah. So well, that's a great question. Yeah. I mean, the siskins and the, the red poles are, are really fond of the black thistle, the Niger seed that you can mm -hmm. get pretty much any uh, big hardware store. They sell it um, and they sell even the little white, like the kind of mesh stalks, you can just hang out and um, the small finches will, will really like those, including gold finches. Um, then, you know, the Black oil sunflower seed is also really popular with the uh, gross beaks, purple finches, pine gross beaks, even gross beaks. Um, you know, we often see them at the cam just chomping away, just sitting there crushing those uh, black oil sunflower with their huge bills. We'll even see the smaller birds like the red poles picking up the, the discarded chaff or the little bits that fall out of their beaks when they're cracking the seeds. So it's, it's really fun to watch. Got a question. Are we seeing larger concentrations of male or female finches showing up in the lower 48? Uh, I'm not really sure about that. If there's any kind of skewing of the ratio, um, some of the birds that may appear superficially to be female-like are also ne not necessarily female. There may be young male birds that also um, look like that, so. Cool. 
Well, I think um, it might be time to take a little trip to the museum with you, Paul. Um, we can maybe switch gears here and serve up some clips from the, the specimens that you work with at the American Museum of Natural History. Um, if you want to start off by just sharing uh, with us maybe a little bit uh, about your collections that you have at the museum. Sure, yeah, the American Museum of Natural History um, maintains a, a large collection of bird specimens, which has been accumulated over um, about 150 years. Some of our specimens are like 200 years old. And it's really the foundation for much of our knowledge about bird um, taxonomy and distribution. And uh, we can see all kinds of um, things through studying the specimens. We can understand um, evolutionary processes. We can understand uh, environmental, um, we could extract environmental information from them. So it's a huge resource for all kinds of uh, research. And my job is to sort of maintain and give access to the specimens for research. Awesome, so let's start off by um, sharing a quick video of some of the specimens that you have there. And I'll let you take the reins here. Now these are these just a little brief intro. These specimens are what we call study skins. So these are this is the traditional way that scientists for 200 years or more have preserved birds for scientific study. They're not meant to be looked at in a display like traditional taxidermy. They are really um, you know for scientists to use. And you'll notice that they all have a little paper tag attached to their feet. Um, this is where we store the data, which is what really makes the specimens useful. The data could include um, where the specimen was collected, when it was collected, information about its uh, biology, um, whether it was in a breeding condition or not. So, um, you know, we could even re we could probably reconstruct historic eruptions using our old specimens of these uh, species as well. Like we could go back to a hundred years ago and find out where evening gross peaks were being found, you know, so there's a lot of historical information uh, that's tied up with these specimens. Um, here we can see the male and female with the female on top. Um, you saw this at the feeder, the, the males um, have that really nice sort of like, I don't know what you call it, yellowish ochre breast color. They got that um, uh, yellow stripe above the eye and above the beak. Um, the large white patches in the wing. They're really an uh, unmistakable bird, really a beautiful uh, finch. Uh, yeah, the first thing that always strikes me is just the size of that bill. And um, can, can you go into a little bit about the name, what Grosbeak means? Well, Grosbeak, it's like a uh, Grobeck, it's like fat beak, big beak. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, it's uh, basically. <laughs> It is what it is. It's describing the uh, the morphology. It's a it's a really big beak, um, a crushing beak for for opening seeds essentially. Yeah, and I'm still I'm still waiting to see one of those at the at the Cornell feeders this year. I'm I'm hoping. So these are the pine gross beaks that we saw, a male and female. Um, these are um, the male on the right with that. Uh, oh, here we go. Good. I'm turning them over. I'm not at the museum, so I had to do this uh, in advance. Um, so you can see the male and female there. They do have uh, quite prominent what we call wing bars. You see those white stripes on the wings. Those are the tips of um, what we call the covert feathers uh, of the wings. Uh, the female there, you can see that nice sort of uh, brownish orangey uh, head and the same pattern on the rump. The male has that kind of frosty pinkish red color, real gorgeous birds. I've only ever seen one of those uh, up in Newfoundland, Canada. So I'm still waiting for them to come down here. This might be your year. Fingers crossed. <laughs> um, yeah, not such a big beak as the, uh, as the evening. Now here's a really special bird. These are the red crossbills, uh, a male on top and a female below. You can see that their beaks are asymmetrical. They're actually crossed over, which looks like it's kind of deformed, but that's actually the way they're supposed to be, that these birds have um, beaks that are designed for, designed, have evolved for um, opening uh, pine cones and extracting, or conifer cones and extracting the seeds. 
And um, red crossbills, there are actually um, many different kinds. It differs slightly in their size and their build size, particularly, and um, their calls. And uh, there's a lot of research going on right now with these species, as um, Ben mentioned. Um, essentially, they act as species, these different kinds. They, they, they don't they probably don't interbreed and they are separated by um, their, their voices and their morphologies. Here's some here's the tricky ID situation. Here's three little finches that are all sort of brownish and streaky. Um, we have female uh, house finch at the top, followed by the female purple and the pine siskin. Um, one thing you can look at is the bill shape. You can see the purple and the house have rather a robust crushing beak, whereas the siskin has a rather pointy little beak that's made for extracting small seeds. Um, as we saw in the video before, the um, purple finch has a kind of a white um, stripe above the eye and a white stripe below the cheek. Um, it's quite prominent in the in the uh, live bird. The siskin you can maybe see has a little bit of green in the wings. Hard to see in this video, but they have a, like a little slight green color. Um, and they're also streaky on the back more so. Oh no, they're all. I guess they're all streaky there on the back. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Um, it looks like a, a a couple questions came in that I thought. Um, are, are um, relevant to the specimens that you just showed. Yeah. And one person was wondering, do the specimens like fade in color or change over time? Um, some species, some birds do fade. It depends on the nature of the pigments. Certain pigments are more stable than others. Um, so the cargilline finch pigments seem to be pretty stable over time. Some of those birds are hundred plus years old wow. and haven't uh, faded, whereas um, others, other kinds of pigments may fade. Um, of course, you have to keep them out of the light. The light can affect them. Awesome. And then uh, one person is asking, are specimens still being collected? Also, um, do you have different types of specimens like uh, wet specimens or skeletons? And I can answer the question yes to the skeletons because we're going to show you those. Oh, yes, specimens are being collected um, according to um, all permitting uh, regulations. And um, we also get a lot of birds nowadays via salvage, birds that have died through other means like windows or cats or whatever. Um, and we do maintain collections of uh, skeletons, wet specimens. We save uh, tissue samples for DNA studies. So yeah, we save pretty much everything we can because um, we don't know what kind of questions scientists may be asking. So we need to save diverse um, types of material. Yeah, that's great. I mean, cataloging all those different things can be so important for questions that may not have even been asked yet. Exactly. Yep. All right, so let's move along and check out some of these really cool um, skulls that you guys have at the Museum of these different finches. So yes, yeah, is like answering your previous question, the previous question there, we do maintain collections of skeletons. As you can see, these are from left to right. We've got the um, evening gross beak, the pine gross beak. We have a red crossbill. Uh, we have, let's see what's coming up now. I believe that is a red. I think that's the red pole. Yep. Uh, siskin. You can see the siskins is slightly more fine pointed beak. So all these birds you can see in the skulls are same, but different. They all have the same elements to them, but they're all arranged in slightly different ways. And this is what people who study morphology look at. They look at the shapes and measurements of all of these um, bones in the skull are pretty complex uh, things. Um, and you can see how each bill is really, you know, different and adapted for different, look at the evening gross beak there, which is like a massive crunching uh, beak. Um, you can see that nice round nostril. So we prepare these specimens actually by using beetles that um, 
eat the flesh off of the skeletons, which is kind of a, a revelation for many people. Um, typically, we take off the horny coating of the beak, but I picked out some skulls here that still maintain that. So you can see um, the outside. So that's basically the, the colorful horny part of the beak is essentially like our fingernail. It's just a, a, a keratin substance. Mm -hmm. And that just will come off uh, of, the, of the bony part underneath. You can see the pine gross beak has a rather uh, hooked uh, tip to the beak. Um, I know they like to eat seeds of uh, certain um, boreal trees. Um, they will go for uh, the fruits of crab apples and, and things like that in the winter. Now here's a real special one. This is the red crossbill and you can see here how the maxilla and the mandible are overlapping and crossed. And it's interesting that um, somebody just asked the question. Some are left-handed and some are right-handed. And mm -hmm. um, I'm not quite sure how that happens, if it's genetic or not. Maybe uh, you can ask Matt about that. But um, it is sort of an interesting phenomenon that is, they're not all the same. Common red pole here with that nice fine tipped beak uh, for extracting um, seed. They eat a lot of birch seeds, um, one of their favorite foods. And they have a very fine pointy little beak. Uh, looks really small when you actually see them on a, on a live bird. And um, you look at the nostrils, very different here from the, from the evening gross beak. And finally, the pine siskin, which um, again has a very fine pointed beak, mostly made for eating, eat, pulling seeds out of. Uh, I've been when, when they were out here, uh, we were seeing them eating like goldenrod and some stuff with very, very small seeds. And uh, they like the little Niger thistle, which is hard to imagine how you, you can make a living off of that stuff. There's, all, there's all nothing to it, but uh, they, they, they do. Yeah, these are so, so cool. And I think the real, the, the neat part about looking at all these, you know, different specimens sort of one by one is, is not only see the, the differences in their morphology, but how it also informs us a little bit about their, the natural diet and the types of foods that they eat. Mm -hmm. um, something that just is always amazing to me when, when looking at um, museum collections. Yeah. Great. Awesome. Well, it looks like we have a couple minutes left for questions. Um, I saw a cool question up here asking if um, any of the um, the collections are being input into databases like eBird. It seems like they might you might know when they were collected or where they were collected right. from. So that's that's something I've been discussing with with people. I mean, we of course have a database of of our collections. And it would be great one day to find a way to upload all of that information into Eber to give us some more historical uh, perspective. Um, unfortunately, a lot of museum specimen data is a little, is not that clean in terms of um, localities. Like you need, you know, localities need to be cleaned up and um, standardized. Same goes for even taxonomic information like the names they were using a hundred years ago may not be the same as we're, we're using now. So one of my jobs is actually trying to standardize and update our specimen data. But it, one day it would be fantastic to pull all that into eBird because we've got stuff going back 200 years, which would be really useful for informing uh, studies of biodiversity changes and uh, totally. climate, uh, climate change, of course, is another thing we could do with that material. So. Yeah, awesome. I, okay, and I see one question that's popped up a lot and uh, probably has to do with people are wondering how long we're going to be able to see these birds um, erupting into these southern ranges. Like when are eruptions ending? Um, when do we see them start going back up into the boreal forests? I don't know if you want to touch on that, Paul, before we have to go today. I, I'm actually not that sure about when you know what causes the the return i remember i remember a few years ago we had a quite a strong siskin return that we we noticed but um i don't really know myself how that 
goes, I mean, I guess we could look at Eber to, to look at previous eruptions and find out when and where those happened. Yep, see, so start the influx back up north to see yeah. where the sightings are happening. I think that's a, that's a great tool to use. Also, um, uh, I know some birds will even, if they find, I think it was pine siskins, if they, they find like really good food crops in areas that they don't usually breed in, sometimes they'll stay there and breed in those areas year round. Crossbills certainly do that. Crossbills, of course, are, are rather than eruptive, I would say more nomadic. You know, they, they can roam around, not necessarily connected with these super flight years. And, you know, the crossbills have, you know, cropped up in different, uh, Long Island recently and other parts of New York State um, because of good cone crops. And then, you know, they'll just find a good spot and they'll sit down and breed. And so they'll, um, yeah, they can, they can pretty much crop up anywhere. Awesome. Well, we, I think we hit 3.30. Um, it's time for us to wrap up today. I uh, wanted to thank everyone for joining us on Facebook and on Zoom today. It was a really fun discussion. I learned a lot from you, Paul. So thank you for joining us. Okay. Um, also, I wanted to thank Aaron Chapman and, and Charles Eldermeyer who are helping us out um, answering questions in the chat and on Facebook. Um, and make sure to to log those sightings that you see into eBird. Um, if you check out any winter finches, email us at birdcams um, at cornell.edu um, with sightings or things you see at the Ontario Feeder Watch Cam. Um, we'll be sure to post links in the chat where you can watch the cam and links for the museum as well. Um, any last words for you, Paul? I'd just like to echo your, your thanks to uh, Aaron and Charles. Um, Aaron did some great work with the camera there shooting those birds. Um, yeah, and please, Everybody put their stuff into eBird and um, you know, we look forward to hopefully seeing you again before, before too long. Maybe we can do a tropical thing in Panama to make it warm. That's a great idea. I think that's, that's uh, something we should focus our efforts on next. So, all right, sorry we ran a little bit late folks, but thank you for coming and have a great uh, snowy weekend if you're in the Northeast or uh, have a great holiday season as well. Thank you. Bye everybody.